Dr. Marie Sanchez was a marine biologist who had devoted her career to studying the behavior of bull sharks. She has spent countless hours diving in the waters off the coast of Florida, observing and documenting the movements and habits of these magnificent creatures. Bull sharks are known for their aggressive nature and their ability to thrive in both saltwater and freshwater environments, making them a particularly fascinating subject for study. Dr. Sanchez had conducted extensive research on the social behavior and movement patterns of bull sharks. She is particularly interested in their migratory patterns and had used sophisticated tracking devices to follow individual sharks as they move between different habitats. Dr. Sanchez is also interested in the feeding habits of bull sharks, which are known to be opportunistic predators, feeding on a wide variety of prey, including fish, turtles, and even other sharks. She has studied the effects of changing ocean temperatures and other environmental factors on the distribution and abundance of prey species, which in turn can impact the behavior of bull sharks. She had received a grant to study the movements and behavior of bull sharks in the Gulf of Mexico and had been meticulously planning her research for months. The Gulf of Mexico was an ideal location for Dr. Sanchez's research, as it was home to a thriving population of bull sharks. She had carefully selected a site for her dive based on her previous observations of shark activity in the area. On the day of her dive, Dr. Sanchez woke up early and prepared her equipment, checking every detail to ensure that everything was in perfect working order. She reviewed her research plan one final time, going over each step in detail to make sure that she had not overlooked anything. As she set out for the dive site, Dr. Sanchez felt a mix of excitement and apprehension. She knew that studying bull sharks could be dangerous and that even the most experienced researchers could fall victim to a sudden attack. But she was also passionate about her work and believed that the insights she would gain from her research could have a significant impact on our understanding of these fascinating creatures. Once she reached the dive site, Dr. Sanchez wasted no time in getting to work. She carefully donned her wetsuit and diving gear, checking each piece to make sure that it was secure. She then descended into the water, her heart racing with anticipation. For the next few hours, Dr. Sanchez swam through the crystal clear waters of the Gulf of Mexico, observing and documenting the movements and behavior of the bull sharks she encountered. She used underwater cameras and tracking devices to gather data, carefully noting each observation in her research journal. She was carefully observing a group of bull sharks when she noticed one particular shark, a large female, exhibiting some unusual behavior. The shark seemed agitated and was swimming erratically, darting back and forth with alarming speed. Dr. Sanchez became increasingly concerned as the shark began to circle her, her movements growing more frenzied by the minute. She realized that the shark had likely been disturbed by her presence and was becoming aggressive. Despite her fear, Dr. Sanchez knew that she needed to remain calm and rational if she was going to survive the encounter. She slowly began to swim away from the shark, maintaining eye contact and making slow, deliberate movements to avoid triggering any sudden attacks. Suddenly, the shark lunged towards Dr. Sanchez, its jaws gaping wide. Instinctively, she rolled onto her back and kicked out with her feet managing to land a blow on the shark's nose. The impact stunned the shark, and she swam away as fast as she could, trying to put as much distance between herself and the shark as possible. She could feel her heart pounding in her chest as she glanced back over her shoulder, expecting to see the shark hot on her trail. But to her relief, the shark seemed to have been momentarily stunned by the blow to its nose, and it did not pursue her. Instead, it circled around in the water, as if trying to decide whether or not to make another attack. Dr. Sanchez knew that she could not let her guard down, even for a moment. She stayed vigilant, keeping an eye on the shark's movements as she swam back towards the boat. But just as she was beginning to feel a sense of relief, the shark suddenly lunged towards her once again. This time, Dr. Sanchez did not have the luxury of surprise. She was ready, and she quickly twisted her body to the side, just narrowly avoiding the shark's jaws as they snapped shut in front of her face. 
she kicked out with her feet, striking the shark's side with all her strength. The impact seemed to stun the shark once again, and it retreated a few feet back, circling around as if weighing its options. Dr. Sanchez knew that she could not keep fending off the shark forever. She needed to make it back to the boat before the shark decided to launch another attack. With adrenaline pumping through her veins, Dr. Sanchez swam as fast as she could, her arms and legs working in perfect synchronization as she propelled herself through the water. The shark pursued her for a few more seconds before finally giving up and disappearing into the depths of the ocean. Dr. Sanchez emerged from the water, gasping for breath, but relieved to have survived the harrowing encounter. She knew that she had narrowly escaped a deadly attack, and she would never forget the lesson she had learned about the power and unpredictability of the creatures she studied. The reason for the bull shark's agitation is not immediately clear to Dr. Sanchez, but bull sharks are known for their aggressive nature and unpredictable behavior and it's possible that the shark was simply reacting to her presence in its territory. However, as Dr. Sanchez later reviewed the footage from her underwater camera, she noticed that the shark had a large fishing hook embedded in its mouth. It was possible that the hook was causing the shark's pain or discomfort, making it more aggressive and unpredictable than usual. Dr. Sanchez knew that the presence of fishing gear and other human activities in the ocean could have a significant impact on the behavior of marine animals. She made a note to investigate further and to share her feelings with local authorities and conservation groups to raise awareness about the need to protect the ocean and its inhabitants. The year was 1883 in the remote coastal towns of Western Australia. Pearl diving was a way of life it was a dangerous job, but for the native people, it was a tradition that had been passed down for generations. One such pearl diver was a young man named Jera, who lived in a small village on the coast. Jera was an expert diver, and he had spent his entire life diving for pearls in the deep waters of the Indian Ocean. He was fearless and had never been afraid of the dangers that came with his job, but one day, his luck ran out. Jera had been diving for pearls for hours, his body accustomed to the deep ocean waters. He had already gathered a good amount of pearls, but he wasn't done yet. He wanted to collect as many as he could before returning to the village. As he dove deeper, he suddenly felt the sharp pain in his left thigh. He thought he had hit a rock or a piece of coral, but when he looked down, he saw a large shadow moving towards him. The shadow grew bigger and bigger, and he realized with horror that it was a shark. Jera's heart raced as the shark closed in on him. It was a massive creature with rows of sharp teeth and a menacing presence. Jera knew he was in trouble, and he had to act fast. He tried to swim away, but the shark followed him, its jaws opening wide. Jera knew he had to fight back. He had heard stories of divers who had successfully fended off sharks and he hoped he could do the same. He punched and kicked the shark in its nose and eyes, hoping to stun it, but the shark was relentless, and it kept coming back. Jera felt the shark's teeth sink into his flesh, and he screamed in pain. He could feel the blood gushing out of his thighs, and he knew he was in a life and death struggle. He desperately tried to grab his spear, but the shark kept attacking him. He fought back with all his might, punching and kicking the shark in the nose and eyes. The shark was relentless, but Jera was determined to live. He managed to get his spear and jabbed it into the shark's side, causing it to retreat. The shark recoiled in pain, and Jera used the opportunity to swim away from the shark. With blood pouring from his wounds, Jera managed to swim back to the surface. His fellow divers saw him bleeding and pulled him onto the boat. The attack had been brutal, and Jera's wounds were severe. His thighs were torn apart, and he had lost a lot of blood. But he was alive, and that was all that mattered. His fellow divers rushed him back to the village where the elders treated his wounds. Despite his injuries, Jera refused to give up pearl diving. It was the only way he knew how to make a living, and he loved the thrill of the hunt. He returned to the ocean a few months later, 
but this time he was more cautious. He had learned a valuable lesson about the dangers of the deep. Years passed, and Jera became a respected elder in the village. He shared his knowledge and experience with the younger divers, warning them of the risk and teaching them how to protect themselves. He was proud of his life as a pearl diver and grateful for the lessons he had learned, even if they had come at a great cost. And so, the tradition of pearl diving in Western Australia continued, with each generation passing on the skills and knowledge of their forefathers. Jarrah's story became a legend, a testament to the bravery and determination of the native people who lived along the rugged coast of the Indian Ocean. Sebastian and Olivia were a surfer couple from California, and they had been recently married. They always dreamed of spending their honeymoon in Hawaii, and they had been planning their dream honeymoon for months. They were both passionate about the ocean and the thrill of catching waves, and they couldn't wait to explore the famous surf spots in Hawaii. It was the perfect destination for the romantic getaway. As they landed in Honolulu, they were greeted by the sun and warm salty breeze and the sound of waves crashing against the shore. They checked into their cozy beachfront cottage and immediately fell in love with the stunning scenery around them. And as they stepped onto the sand, they felt like they were in paradise. The first few days of their honeymoon were spent surfing some of the best waves in the world. They visited Waikiki Beach, where they rode the gentle waves and watched the local surfers show off their skills. They also went to the North Shore, where they challenged themselves with the bigger, more powerful waves. They also hiked through the lush rainforest, and they visited the historic Pearl Harbor Memorial. On the second week of their honeymoon, they decided to visit the island of Maui. There, they rented a jeep and drove along the scenic road to Hana, taking in breathtaking views of the coastline. One day, they decided to try their luck at a secluded surf spot that they had heard about from the locals. It was a hidden gem surrounded by stunning cliffs and crystal clear water. As they paddled out, they noticed that there was no other surfers around, and they felt like they had found their own private paradise. But as they waited for the next set of waves, they suddenly heard a loud splash behind them. They noticed a dark shape moving towards them. At first, they thought it was a dolphin, but as it got closer, they realized it was a tiger shark, its jaws wide open. The shark's razor-sharp teeth were visible, and the couple froze in terror. Their hearts raced as they watched the shark swim towards them, its sharp teeth glinting in the sun. Sebastian and Olivia tried to paddle away, but the shark quickly caught up to them. The couple could see the shark circling them, and they knew they were in serious trouble. Fear filled their hearts as they saw the massive predator getting closer and closer. Olivia's heart was pounding as she remembered stories of tiger sharks attacking humans. She looked over at Sebastian, who was trying to remain calm, but she could see the fear in his eyes too. They had never felt so vulnerable before. The couple tried to stay together and keep their boards close, hoping that the shark would lose interest and swim away. But the tiger shark seemed to be fixated on them, and it kept circling them, getting closer with every pass. Olivia's mind raced as she tried to come up with a plan. She knew that they had to stay calm and not make any sudden movements that would attract the shark's attention. They had to make themselves as small and unappetizing as possible. As the shark swam closer, Sebastian grabbed Olivia's hand and whispered to her to stay still. He knew that any sudden movements could provoke the shark and make it attack. They watched in horror as the shark came closer and closer until they could see its eyes staring at them. Suddenly, the shark turned and swam away, disappearing into the depths of the ocean. The couple let out a sigh of relief, but they knew they had narrowly escaped a terrifying fate. They started paddling towards the shore as quickly as they could, hoping that the shark wasn't following them anymore. They could feel the fear rising in their chest, but they refused to give up. They kept paddling, their arms burning with exertion. Finally, they reached the shore and they scrambled onto the sand, panting and sweating. Sebastian and Olivia paddled back to the shore, shaken but grateful to be alive. They knew that they had been lucky 
and they would never forget the terror they had experienced that day. From that day on, they vowed to always be aware of the dangers of the ocean and to respect its creatures, especially the mighty tiger shark. As their honeymoon came to an end, Sebastian and Olivia knew that they had had a one-of-a-kind experience and made memories that would last a lifetime. The animosity of a provoked shark is one of the most terrifying things a person can witness, let alone experience. Sharks have rows of razor-sharp teeth attached to a powerful jaw, capable of ripping a human head off in an instant. So the fear of the ocean that many people have is quite justified. The story we have for you today concerns Sam Mitchell, a tourist who found himself in the murky deep and in the face of death from which he didn't manage to escape. The story of his demise was told by his best friend Thomas as a first-hand witness. Thomas and Sam met in Oklahoma during a comedy show in 2000 and remained steadfast friends through shared interest and a love for ocean fishing. The pair went on many voyages to catch fish from the waterways of their hometown to the deep oceans around the United States. Sam's favorite fishing experience was fishing for Goliath groupers in the Florida Keys, as the sheer power of the beast was something that couldn't be described with words. They spent many holidays on family fishing trips, as Sam was Thomas's best man at his wedding. Sam was a solitary type, enjoying only the company of his dog and the occasional girlfriend. He always had his best friend, so the pair decided they would relive their Goliath grouper experience on the 10th anniversary of the day they met. They booked a trip to Florida in August of 2010 and arrived in the early hours of the morning. They specifically wanted to go to the Florida Keys again, so they set up their accommodation in the same place as before since they knew the owner. The next day, they enjoyed the time they took off work to lounge around the beach all day, stopping at the local sites and driving to Miami for some drinks. They didn't stay too long as they wanted an early start to the fishing, so they got back around 10 p.m. The following morning, the pair went out to rent a boat as well as some fishing equipment they would need for the day. Regulations were stricter at this point, so they had to have two boat instructors with them despite their experience in both piloting a boat and fishing for Goliaths. The men that went with them were also seasoned fishermen, and despite their age, they were excellent, enjoyable company for Sam and Thomas. It took them about 30 minutes to reach the place where the groupers usually gathered, and it was a relaxing experience for the most part. Groupers are notoriously powerful fish, so fishermen need to use a 400-pound monofilament line to even attempt to pull them in. Luckily, Sam and Thomas's boat was equipped with everything they would need. The fish took a while to bite despite the fresh bait the two guys procured at the start of their journey, but one did eventually bite, and it nearly pulled Thomas into the ocean within a moment. It was a 600-pound Goliath grouper. Sam and one of the instructors rushed to help Thomas keep hold of the fish, and they just barely managed it. It took some while to tire the grouper out, but eventually floated up to the surface, and the group marveled at the sheer size of it. They freed the large hook from the fish's lip and pushed it a bit to get it to swim again. Harvesting or killing a grouper was only allowed during certain seasons, and often through a lottery draw for a single fish but just the adrenaline of reeling in a behemoth like that was enough for any fisherman. The day went on and the group caught some smaller fish as well as the occasional grouper, but it started going wrong when Sam managed to hook one. His battle with the fish was cumbersome and difficult, but Sam managed to pull the fish up by himself as it wasn't as large as the previous fish they caught. As it floated on the surface, they noticed that the fish was tangled in a mess of netting and their line inhibiting its movement. Sam reached for his cutters and went to cut the netting from the fish before removing the hook, but it was tightly wrapped around the fish's tail and back fence. He pulled at it to gain some slack, but to no avail. The fish was bleeding and clearly in pain, so Sam set to work on cutting the netting away. As he was making progress, 
the fish recovered from the fatigue and started thrashing in the water, getting Sam's hand caught in the netting and pulling him overboard. He fell behind the fish, and only his arm was visible across the top of it. But the group's panic subsided when they saw Sam, smiling and saying he was okay. He still had his cutters and managed to free his hand and the few remaining strands of netting before Thomas pulled the hook from its mouth and it was on its way. Sam chucked the netting in the boat so it could be repurposed or thrown away safely, and he kept treading water as Thomas called him a crazy bastard for doing what he did. Sam waved him off and remarked how he wouldn't forget that one. He was still smiling at what had happened, but Thomas realized that something was wrong. His blood turned to ice as he saw the surface of the water distort and splash, which Sam didn't notice. A giant red maw erupted from the water and engulfed Sam's head, pulling him under the water within a second. That single second seemed to span a lifetime as Thomas saw his best friend's life end in front of him. Thomas and the instructors yelled in surprise and stared in shock as they processed what they had just seen. They ran to the railing and looked to see where Sam was, but all they saw was his body floating just below the surface. They later confirmed that a great white shark had most likely smelled the chum and bait used to lure the groupers to the boat and took its chance with Sam. Thomas immediately leaped into the water and grabbed Sam's body, helping the others haul it up into the boat. The shark was nowhere to be seen. He fell to the floor as the reality of the situation crashed down on him, and he began sobbing uncontrollably. One of the fishermen pulled Thomas to the side and shielded him from the side of Sam's body, while the other wrapped the body in a spare tarp to preserve his dignity. The trip back to shore was silent and dreadful, with Thomas falling into fits and panic attacks over the incident. The floor and sides of the boat were covered in blood from both the fish and Sam's body. Emergency services were called, which took Sam's body to wait for his family to arrive. By that time, a curious crowd of people gathered to see what had happened. Some of them were silent and respectful, while others whispered among themselves. Sam had his mother and father, as well as a younger sister. It took them five hours to arrive on account of the flight, but Thomas was glad to see them as he had had time to calm down and get a change of clothes. They went to the morgue and Sam's mother demanded to see her son, disregarding Thomas's warnings about his body. She got the chance to see it and she screamed in anguish at the sight. She blamed Thomas for the incident, despite it not being his fault, which he didn't take to heart as he understood how she felt. Sam's mother was in hysterics, so he left the hospital's morgue to allow the family to grieve on their own. The walk back to the room was solemn, and Thomas kept repeating what had happened in his head multiple times. He couldn't accept that his best friend was dead, and the night he spent alone in the room was haunting. He somehow got through the night and boarded a plane back to Oklahoma the next day, phoning his wife and telling her about the incident in the process. She was supportive and came to pick him up at the airport. He wasn't the same for many months after the incident, developing severe depression and anxiety that made day-to-day -day life debilitating without medication. He eventually moved past the incident and even got back in touch with Sam's family to provide mutual support. Australia has some of the most beautiful and diverse wildlife in the world. From the smallest critters that can kill you with a single touch to massive beasts that dominate the ocean. Sharks are commonplace in Australia and notorious for being extremely aggressive when provoked, something that Felix Marsh would come to find out during a scuba dive west of Perth in 2010. Faulty instruction and poor judgment would change Felix's life forever as he came face to face with the power of a massive great white shark. Felix was a Perth resident and spent a great deal of his life in the water, surfing in his free time when not at his job as a construction worker. However, one day, one of his friends came to him with the proposition of taking a scuba diving class, where an instructor would show them the ropes 
and they would be able to check out some of the coral life near the shoreline and see what sorts of fish roam around it. Felix was quick to accept the proposition, and they set up their dive to be in the following week. He managed to snag some free time from work, so everything was going according to plan. On the day of their scheduled dive, Felix and his friend Jan went to the beach before everyone else, and they were both comfortable with surfing on the surface of the water, but not so much being under it. There was no one at the meeting place for the dive, but people started eventually showing up, and they seemed just as nervous as Felix and Jan. They made their acquaintance, and they all remarked how they felt safer knowing that more people were supposed to join them on the dive. All in all, there were five of them there, waiting on the instructor. The instructor arrived eventually, but he was 20 minutes late. He blamed his tardiness on traffic and a hangover, which set the group on edge. However, he had a friendly outlook and seemed confident, so the group went along with it. They boarded a small boat stocked with the necessary gear for a scuba dive and went out a few hundred yards from the shore. This was a rookie dive, so the instructor only wanted to show them the basics and some of the underwater flora and fauna through a quick dive. After a rather tedious but detailed instruction on how the scuba gear is supposed to work and how they had to behave in the water, some basic communication signals, and more. Before long, the six of them took their positions on each side of the boat and flung themselves back into the water. Felix remembered that the initial shock of the cold water was disorienting at the start, but he was quick to get acclimated and was gliding through the water in no time. He was struck by the immediate beauty of the corals below them and the, at a glance, millions of fish swimming around them. At the instructor's command, they commenced the descent lower so they could see the reef more clearly. Felix and Jan were entranced by the fish and the vivid beauty of the reef, but they couldn't help but feel like they were being watched. In truth, they were fine as the instructor had years of experience under his belt. The group continued descending until they were a few yards from the reef itself. The instructor told them that they were not to touch anything on the reef, as it was a single massive organism, and it mustn't be disturbed. The group was okay with that, so they circled the reef and took in the sights. After a few minutes, Felix felt a strong grip on his shoulder and turned to see Jan with a terrified expression on his face, pointing beyond the reef. The pair went to investigate, only to find that the reef was being stalked by a massive great white shark. Jan later reported that the beast must have been around 20 feet, which is the maximum length a great white can reach. They immediately backed up and went to tell the instructor, who pointed for them to surface. After they breached the surface, a few of the divers immediately panicked and started swimming towards the boat. But the instructor stopped them and said there was nothing to worry about. As long as they didn't disturb the shark, they were fine. Felix and Jan were calmed by this information, but the rest of the group did not feel comfortable remaining in the water, much less after the guide suggested that they swim to the shark to interact with it. Felix, Jan, and the instructor went for another dive while the rest of the group went to the boat. And with each passing second, the pair became more paranoid that the shark would attack them. But they figured that the experience would be worth the risk. As they approached the shark, Felix thought about how dead its black eyes looked. But they didn't seem threatening. They got close to it at the instructor's command and touched the shark. Amazed at how rough the surface of its skin felt, even through the mesh of the wetsuit. It was covered in scars most likely from previous battles for dominance with other sharks. The shark circled them a few times, and it seemed to be minding its own business. However, things changed when they noticed that it started getting uncomfortably close to Jan, which Felix signaled to the instructor, but he didn't respond. This irritated Felix, who quickly swam up to Jan and pulled him away. This caught the shark's attention. As though a switch flipped, the shark suddenly twisted in its trajectory and made a beeline toward Felix, sinking its teeth into his arm and flailing wildly, seemingly trying to rip it off. Felix's respirator immediately fell out of his mouth as he let out a scream that was muted by the water around him. The instructor and Jan immediately swam up to attempt to free Felix, but the shark was simply too strong. Before they knew it, 
The water was red with Felix's blood, and they could barely see anything. Jan, who was holding on to Felix, felt his friend float into his arms as the shark shot away from them with a trophy in its mouth. Felix was unconscious by this point and losing a tremendous amount of blood, so Jan immediately started swimming up, clutching his friend by his side, with the instructor following close. When they breached the surface, the rest of the group on the boat was waiting with bated breath as they didn't know what else to do. But two of them rushed to pull Felix out of the water. They managed to get him on the deck of the ship, and one of the divers went to get some cloth from her bag to tie off Felix's mangled arm. It was completely torn off at the elbow, with visible bone and sinew sticking out. Jan later remarked that it was no wonder that he passed out from the pain, as the injury was so horrific. The instructor rushed to the wheel of the boat and sped them towards the shore, alerting the Coast Guard about the situation, so there was an ambulance ready for them when they arrived. Jan stayed with Felix the entire trip back, which took less than ten minutes as it was a rookie dive. When they arrived at the shore, an ambulance was waiting for them, along with a crowd of people curious about its purpose there. The paramedics ran to the boat and rushed Felix to the ambulance, which took him and Jan to the nearest hospital. Felix had lost a nearly fatal amount of blood, so his heart rate lowered, and they barely managed to keep him alive on the way to the ER. He was admitted and had to stay in the ICU for a prolonged period while his blood level stabilized and the doctors had a chance to treat his arm. It was a clean break at the elbow, but the skin around it was shredded by the shark's teeth, resulting in nerve damage and loss of function up to Felix's elbow. He did manage to make a full recovery, however, but the trauma of the incident left him with PTSD and a strong fear of the ocean, the lassophobia. He never went into the ocean again, and the only bright spot of the incident was that Felix and Jan's friendship only deepened. The reason the instructor did not act in time was that he was holding his eyes shut through a migraine brought about by his hangover. The diving company fired the instructor and offered compensation for Felix's treatment. Toshiro was part of a crew of experienced fishermen who had been working together for years. They had all grown up in the coastal town of Yokohama, Japan, and had learned to fish from their fathers and grandfathers before them. They had caught all kinds of fish, from small anchovies to large tuna, and had even managed to snag a few exotic fish that had fetched a high price at the local fish market. But there was one fish that had always eluded them, and that was the shark. Sharks were known to be one of the most elusive and dangerous fish in the sea and catching one was considered a feat of great skill and bravery. Toshiro had heard that there was a high demand for shark meat in the city and that it fetched a premium price at the market. He knew that catching a shark would not only be a personal accomplishment, but it would also be a lucrative business opportunity. Despite knowing that it was illegal to catch sharks, Toshiro couldn't resist the temptation. He believed that he could catch one without getting caught by the authorities and was willing to take the risk. He began researching the best bait and techniques for catching sharks and spent hours on his boat scanning the horizon for any signs of a shark. He even invested in special gear, including a stronger fishing line and hooks, to ensure that he would be able to catch the shark once he found it. Toshiro was determined to catch the shark, not just for the thrill of the hunt, but also for the potential profits it could bring him. He was willing to break the law to achieve his goal, even though he knew the risk and consequences of getting caught. That is why when Toshiro heard that there had been sightings of sharks in the open waters of the Pacific Ocean, he suggested to the crew that they try to catch one, knowing that it would be a risky but potentially lucrative endeavor. The crew was looking for a big catch to make up for the slow fishing they had experienced earlier in the week, so they agreed to Toshiro's suggestion albeit reluctantly. They set to work, preparing their gear and bait for the shark hunt. They had a large boat equipped with a powerful motor, and they scanned the horizon for any signs of a shark's fin. They knew that sharks were attracted to schools of fish, so he scanned the water for any signs of movement or activity. They also checked their fishing chart to identify areas where the water was deeper, 
hoping that this would increase their chances of finding sharks. After a few hours of searching, Toshiro spotted a large fin breaking the surface of the water in the distance. He knew that this was likely the shark he had been looking for, and he quickly steered the boat in its direction. As they approached the shark, Toshiro could feel his heart pounding in his chest. He knew that sharks were dangerous and that any misstep could be fatal, but he was determined to catch the shark, and he believed that he had the skills and experience to do so. Toshiro, being the most experienced fisherman in the crew, took the lead and began taunting the shark with his fishing pole, hoping to provoke it into attacking. But the shark was not easily fooled. It circled their boat, watching him carefully and waiting for an opportunity to strike. Toshiro cast his line, using a large piece of fish as bait. He waited patiently for the shark to bite, hoping that he had chosen the right spot and the right time to catch it. The tension on his fishing line was palpable, and he could feel his adrenaline rising as he waited for the shark to take the bait. Finally, the shark made its move, lunging at the bait with lightning speed. Toshiro pulled his line away, trying to get the shark to come closer to the boat so they could catch it. The crew was excited, and they cheered Toshiro on, watching as he fought with the shark. But the shark was too quick, and it turned on him, attacking his arm and dragging him into the water. The crew quickly sprang into action, pulling Toshiro back onto the boat and attempting to save his life. They saw that Toshiro had suffered serious injuries, with bite marks on his arm and torso, and blood was gushing from the wounds. The crew knew that time was of the essence, and they immediately began to administer first aid to Toshiro. One of the crew members applied pressure to the wounds to stop the bleeding, while another crew member checked Toshiro's pulse and breathing. The crew realized that they needed to get Toshiro back to shore as soon as possible so he could receive proper medical attention. They radioed for emergency assistance and were able to get in touch with a Coast Guard who sent a rescue helicopter to their location. In the meantime, the crew worked tirelessly to stabilize Toshiro's condition. They covered him with blankets to keep him warm and hydrated him with fluids. They also monitored his vital signs closely, taking turns to make sure he was comfortable and stable. When the rescue helicopter arrived, the crew helped to transfer Toshiro onto a stretcher and lifted him onto the helicopter. They stayed with him during the flight back to shore, offering words of encouragement and comfort. When they reached the hospital, the crew stayed by Toshiro's side, waiting anxiously for news of his condition. Despite their best efforts, however, Toshiro's injuries were too severe, and he passed away a few hours later. After Toshiro's tragic death, the crew was deeply affected and mourned his loss for several weeks. They had lost not only a colleague, but also a dear friend. The incident had a profound impact on the crew, and they realized that they had taken unnecessary risk in their pursuit of the shark. They vowed never to put themselves in danger again and to prioritize safety above all else. The crew decided to start a safety training program for fishermen in their town in order to prevent similar accidents from happening in the future. They worked with local authorities and fishing associations to develop safety protocols and trainings and they share their experience with other fishermen. Despite the tragedy, the crew continued to fish and work together, but with a renewed sense of caution and respect for the sea. They had learned a valuable lesson about the dangers of their profession and the importance of safety, and they were determined to never forget it. As the sun rose over the pristine waters of the Great Barrier Reef, Harvey woke up in his small cabin on board the dive boat. He was excited to begin another day of diving and exploring the wonders of the reef. After a quick breakfast, Harvey joined his fellow divers on the deck to gear up for the first dive. The crew helped him check their equipment, including the scuba tanks, weight belts, and wetsuits. Once everything was set, Harvey and the other divers donned their mask and fins and plunged into the crystal clear water. As he descended, Harvey felt the cool water envelop him. He gazed around him, marveling at the colorful corals and the schools of tropical fish that darted past him. 
He spotted a giant manta ray gliding gracefully overhead, and he felt a rush of excitement and awe. For the next hour, Harvey and his dive buddies explored the reef, taking in the breathtaking beauty of this underwater paradise. They spotted a sea turtle lazily swimming by, and Harvey snapped some photos with his underwater camera. He also saw a small octopus hiding in a crevice and a bright orange starfish clinging to a rock. As they ascended back to the surface, Harvey felt a sense of exhilaration and joy. He couldn't wait for the next dive, which was scheduled for later that morning. After a brief break, Harvey and the others geared up again and headed back into the water. This time, they were on a mission to locate a sunken shipwreck that was rumored to be in the area. Using their compasses and underwater maps, they navigated through the reef until they reached the spot where the wreck was supposed to be. At first, they saw nothing but sand and coral, but suddenly, Harvey spotted a dark shape looming in the distance. As they got closer, they realized it was indeed a shipwreck covered in barnacles and surrounded by schools of fish. They swam around the wreck, exploring its nooks and crannies and taking more photos. Harvey was thrilled to have discovered such an amazing sight, and he felt a sense of pride and accomplishment. After the second dive, Harvey and the others returned to the dive boat, tired but happy. They chatted about their experiences and shared their photos, swapping stories and tips. Harvey couldn't believe how lucky he was to have such an incredible job, exploring one of the most beautiful places on Earth. As the sun set over the reef, Harvey settled into his cabin, ready for a good night's sleep. He knew that tomorrow would bring more adventures and more discoveries, and he couldn't wait to see what the reef had in store for him next. Harvey had always been fascinated by shipwrecks, and after yesterday's dive where they discovered one in the Great Barrier Reef, he knew he had to return for a closer look. He planned his dive carefully, ensuring he had all the necessary gear, and set out early in the morning together with his fellow divers. As they approached the shipwreck, he noticed something moving in the distance. At first, he assumed it was just a school of fish, but as he got closer, he realized it was something much bigger, a great white shark. Harvey's heart began to race with excitement and apprehension. He had never encountered great white sharks up close before, and he knew that one wrong move could mean disaster. As Harvey entered the water, he was immediately struck by the sheer size and power of the great white sharks. They glided through the water with an effortless grace, their razor-sharp teeth gleaming in the sunlight. Despite their fearsome reputation, Harvey felt a deep respect and awe for these magnificent creatures. He moved slowly and deliberately, keeping a safe distance while carefully tagging each one with a small device. As the day wore on, Harvey's initial apprehension began to give way to a sense of wonder and exhilaration. He was witnessing one of nature's most incredible spectacles, and he knew that he was privileged to be a part of it. Harvey watched the massive shark circling around the shipwreck. He knew that great whites were common in the area, but he had never encountered one up close before. He hesitated for a moment, wondering if they should abandon the dive, but his curiosity got the better of him and he convinced the others to press on. They approached the wreck slowly and carefully, keeping a close eye on the shark. As they got closer, Harvey realized that the wreck was home to a whole ecosystem of marine life. Schools of fish swam in and out of the nooks and crannies, and he saw lobsters and crabs scurrying along the ocean floor. He also noticed that the great white shark seemed to be hunting around the wreck, using it as a source of food. Harvey watched in amazement as the shark darted in and out of the shadows, searching for prey. For a few minutes, Harvey forgot his fear and was completely absorbed in the underwater world around him. He was so engrossed in his observations when he felt something shift in his backpack. He tried to adjust it, but in doing so, he accidentally kicked a small rock that had been resting on the ocean floor. The sound of the rock hitting the shipwreck echoed through the water. And suddenly, Harvey heard a loud thrashing sound. He looked around and saw a massive shark heading straight for him. Harvey knew that he had made a mistake. He had accidentally disturbed the shark's peaceful existence and now put himself in grave danger. He tried to swim away as fast as he could, 
but the shark was too fast. It closed in on him, and Harvey could see its sharp teeth glinting in the dim light. The group was horrified as they watched the shark relentlessly attack Harvey, its jaws clamped tightly around his shoulder. Without wasting a second, the group of divers sprang into action. They formed a human chain, trying to distract the shark and draw its attention away from Harvey. Some of them even swam towards the shark and tried to hit it with their diving gear. Another diver signaled for the group to surface and call for help, hoping that a nearby boat or rescue team could come to their aid. However, the shark was too strong and too determined to let go of its prey. It thrashed around violently, causing chaos in the water. The shark was relentless, and it took all of the divers' courage and strength to keep it at bay. They were finally able to pry Harvey free from the shark's jaws, but unfortunately, it was too late. The force of the shark's bite had already decapitated Harvey. Despite the divers' valiant efforts, they were unable to save Harvey from the shark's jaws. As the reality of the situation set in, the divers were left feeling helpless and devastated. They had lost a member of their group, a friend, and a fellow adventurer. They felt a deep sense of grief and sorrow. They knew that the memory of that terrifying encounter with the shark would stay with them forever. They were shocked by the suddenness and violence of the attack, as well as by the realization of how short life was. The sight of their friend being attacked by the shark was something that would haunt them for a long time to come. In the aftermath of the attack, the group was left with renewed respect for the power and unpredictability of nature, as well as a greater appreciation for the fragility of life. They knew that they had been lucky to escape with their lives, and that they would need to be even more careful and vigilant in the future. Kai had always been drawn to the ocean. He grew up in Hawaii, spending his childhood exploring the coral reefs and learning about the creatures that lived beneath the waves. As he got older, he became fascinated with scuba diving, and he spent every spare moment honing his skills and exploring the underwater world. But there was another reason that Kai was out diving that day. He had recently started working for a local conservation organization, and part of his job involved monitoring the health of the coral reefs and the creatures that lived there. Kai was passionate about the environment and was determined to do everything he could to protect it. He knew that the oceans were facing unprecedented threats from climate change to overfishing to pollution, and he wanted to do his part to make a difference. So when he heard that there had been reports of tiger sharks in the area, Kai knew that he had to investigate. He knew that tiger sharks were one of the ocean's most fearsome predators, but he also knew that they played a vital role in the ecosystem. Kai woke up early that morning, excited for his planned scuba diving excursion. He had been looking forward to this day for weeks as he was planning to explore a new reef that had never been visited before. He packed his stuff and set out for the boat launch, eager to start his adventure. As he set out on his dive, Kai was focused and determined. He had his dive gear checked and double checked, and he made sure that he was fully prepared for whatever he might encounter. He knew that the ocean was unpredictable, but he was confident in his abilities and his training. As the boat anchored, Kai suited up and prepared to enter the water. He checked his gear carefully, making sure that everything was in working order. Then he slipped into the water, feeling the cool rush of the ocean around him. Kai began his descent, marveling at the beauty of the reef below him. He saw schools of colorful fish, vibrant coral formations, and even a few sea turtles. He felt alive and free, completely immersed in the wonders of the underwater world. As Kai was exploring the reef, he suddenly saw the dark shape of a tiger shark swimming towards him. He recognized the shark immediately and knew that he had to be careful. His heart began to race as the shark circled around him, its sharp teeth glinting in the sunlight. He slowly backed away from the shark, trying to keep some distance between himself and the predator. But the shark was persistent and continued to circle around him. Kai tried to remain calm, remembering his training and how to handle shark encounters. Kai knew that he had to keep his wits about him, 
He tried to keep his breathing slow and steady, hoping that the shark would eventually lose interest and swim away. But then, without warning, the shark suddenly lunged towards him. Kai felt a sharp pain in his arm as the shark's teeth sank into his flesh. He kicked and flailed, trying to fight off the shark, but it was too strong. As the shark continued to bite down on his arm, Kai remembered the small knife that he always carried with him. With all his strength, Kai plunged the knife into the shark's eye. The shark let go of him immediately, thrashing in pain. Kai swam away as fast as he could, his arm throbbing with pain. He knew that he had to get back to the surface as quickly as possible. He was bleeding profusely from the wound on his arm and was in severe pain. He managed to grab onto a nearby buoy and called for help. As he waited, Kai tried to keep his breathing steady, trying not to panic. He knew that he was lucky to have survived the attack and was grateful for his training and quick thinking that had saved his life. Finally, a nearby boat heard his cries for help and rushed over to rescue him. They pulled him aboard and immediately called for emergency services. Kai was rushed to the hospital where he underwent emergency surgery to repair the damage to his arm. The doctors managed to stop the bleeding and stabilize his condition, but Kai still had a long road to recovery ahead of him. Over the next few days, Kai remained in the hospital receiving treatment for his injuries. He underwent multiple surgeries to repair the damage to his arm and had to undergo physical therapy to regain his strength and mobility. Despite the pain and discomfort, Kai remained in good spirits. He was grateful for the outpouring of support and well wishes from his family, friends, and fellow divers. He knew that he was lucky to have survived the attack and was determined to make a full recovery. As he slowly regained his strength, Kai began to reflect on the experience. He knew that he had come face to face with one of the ocean's most fearsome predators and had managed to survive through quick thinking and training. He also knew that he had a responsibility to share his story and to use it as a teaching moment for others. So Kai began to speak out about his experience, sharing his story with local schools, dive clubs, and conservation organizations. He talked about the importance of respecting the ocean and its inhabitants, and he stressed the need for education and awareness about the dangers of the open water. Despite the trauma of the experience, Kai refused to give up his passion for diving. He knew that the ocean was full of danger, but it was also full of wonder and beauty. And he was determined to continue exploring its depths, no matter what dangers lay ahead. Johannes's family lived in a small coastal town in South Africa. Tuadros, the father, promised Johannes to take him out fishing on his 14th birthday. They had been planning a fishing trip off the coast for weeks. Johannes was excited to spend the day on the boat with his father and younger brother, Adrius, hoping to catch some big fish. Tuadros was an experienced fisherman, but it would be the first time he would take Johannes and Adrius out with him on the deeper parts of the ocean to catch some big fish. Usually, the two would only fish on the shallower parts of the water and catch small fish. Johannes woke up on his 14th birthday to the sound of his father's voice calling out to him. He couldn't wait to spend the day out on the water with his father and younger brother. They loaded up their fishing gear and set out on their small boat, the sun just beginning to rise over the horizon. The weather was perfect, with clear blue skies and a gentle breeze blowing. The water was calm, and they had been fishing for several hours, catching all sorts of fish, including yellowfin, tuna, and dorado. They spent their morning enjoying their catch and the peacefulness of the ocean. Johannes felt grateful to be spending his birthday with the two most important people in his life. As they were about to head back to shore, just after midday, something caught Johannes' eye. A shadowy figure was circling their boat, and he soon realized it was a shark. Tuadros attempted to maneuver the boat away from the shark, but it was too late. Before anyone could react, it had grabbed Johannes by the leg from the boat. The family was horrified as they watched the shark pulling Johannes underwater. Without hesitation, Tuadros dove into the water after his son, 
determined to save him. He could hear Johannes' screams echoing in his head as he swam towards him. As Tuadros reached his son, he saw that the shark had bitten Johannes' leg. Blood was pouring out, and Tuadros knew they had to act quickly. Tuadros pulled Johannes towards him and used all his strength to swim back to their boat. The shark was still circling them, but Tuadros knew he had to protect his son. As the two got to the edge of the boat, Adrius helped pull them both onto the boat. The shark tried to attack again, but Tuadros kicked it away with all his might. Once they were back on the boat, Tuadros and Adrius immediately began to tend to Johannes' wounds. They were horrified to see the extent of his injuries. The shark's teeth had left deep, jagged wounds all over his right leg, and blood was pouring out of him in torrents. They frantically searched for a first aid kit, but all they could find were a few bandages and some antiseptic spray. With no other options, Johannes' father knew that he had to take drastic measures to save his son's life. He grabbed a fishing knife and began cutting away at Johannes' torn flesh, trying to stem the bleeding. It was a gruesome sight, with blood and bits of flesh splattering all over the boat. Johannes' screams of agony filled the air, and his family could do nothing but watch in horror as his father tried to save him. After what felt like an eternity, the bleeding finally slowed down, and Johannes' father was able to wrap his wounds in makeshift bandages, but they knew they needed to get to the hospital quickly. Adrius was able to call for help on the radio while Tuadros and Johannes were fighting off the shark, and luckily, there was another fishing boat nearby that responded. They helped the wounded Johannes and his family onto their boat and sped towards the shore and took him to the nearest hospital. The morning after the attack, a team of marine biologists and shark experts arrived at the hospital where Johannes was being treated. They were determined to identify the shark that had bitten him and caused such a horrific injury. Johannes' leg was heavily bandaged and he was still in shock from the experience but he knew that by helping the experts identify the shark, he could prevent other people from being attacked in the future. The team of experts carefully examined the bite marks on Johannes' leg. They took measurements and analyzed the pattern of the teeth marks. They also took DNA samples from the wound. Using this information, they were able to determine that the shark responsible for the attack was a great white shark. The experts continued their investigation trying to determine why the shark had attacked Johannes. They examined the area where the attack took place and looked for any signs of unusual behavior from the shark. After several days of intense research and analysis, they discovered that the shark was likely a juvenile great white who had become disoriented and confused. The shark was probably searching for food and mistook Johannes's leg for prey. The experts worked tirelessly to share their findings with the public and educate people about the importance of shark conservation. They urge people to respect the ocean and its inhabitants and to take precautions when swimming or fishing in shark-infested waters. The attack took place near Seal Island, a well-known location for great white sharks. The island was home to a large colony of seals, which attracted the sharks to the area. Despite the potential danger, Many fishermen and tourists still venture out into the waters around the island, hoping to catch a glimpse of the majestic creatures. Meanwhile, Johannes continued to recover from his injuries with the support of his family and the entire community. He was grateful for the work of the experts who had identified the shark, and he hoped that his experience could help prevent future attacks and protect both humans and sharks alike. It was a bright and sunny day at the Surf Beach in California, a popular destination for locals and tourists alike. It was a long stretch of golden sand dotted with brightly colored umbrellas and beach chairs. The water was a vibrant turquoise blue and the waves were gentle and inviting. There were several volleyball nets set up on the beach and people could be seen playing games and lounging in the sun. Music played from portable speakers, adding to the festive atmosphere. The beach was flanked by tall cliffs on either side, creating a natural amphitheater that amplified the sounds of the waves and the laughter of the people on the beach. The cliffs were covered in lush green foliage, 
providing a striking contrast to the golden sand and blue water. At one end of the beach, there was a small harbor where boats could be rented for fishing or sightseeing. At the other end, there was a rocky outcropping that jetted out into the water, providing a popular spot for cliff jumping. There were several amenities on the beach, including restrooms, showers, and a snack bar. Lifeguards were on duty throughout the day, keeping watch over the water and ensuring the safety of the swimmers. A group of teenagers had decided to go for a swim in the ocean because it was a hot summer day and they wanted to cool off in the water. They had spent the morning playing beach volleyball and lounging in the sun, and as the day wore on, the heat became almost unbearable. Among them was 17-year-old Alex, who had always loved the water and was an excellent swimmer. The water looked inviting, and they could see other people swimming and splashing around, so they decided to join in on the fun. They had heard rumors that there were sometimes sharks in the area, but they didn't think much of it. After all, they had been swimming in the ocean before and had never encountered any dangerous predators. As they waded into the water, the teenagers felt the coolness of the ocean wash over them. They laughed and joked, splashing each other and enjoying the freedom of being in the water. They swam out further and further, enjoying the waves and the sun on their skin. They didn't notice anything out of the ordinary, and the water seemed calm and peaceful. Then suddenly, Alex felt a sharp pain in his leg. He looked down to see a massive great white shark, its razor-sharp teeth sinking deep into his flesh. The force of the attack knocked him off his feet, and he struggled to stay afloat as the shark dragged him underwater. The group of teenagers witnessed a horrifying and violent attack as the shark's teeth sank deep into Alex's flesh, causing him to cry out in pain. The other teenagers screamed and tried to swim away, but the shark was too fast. As the shark circled back around for a second attack, its jaws gaped wide open as it prepared to strike again. This time, it bit down hard on Alex's torso, severing his body in two. The teenagers saw the full extent of the damage it had caused as their friend's lifeless body floated to the surface, torn apart and mangled beyond recognition. They watched in horror as the shark continued to thrash around, hungry for more. The other teenagers in the group realized they were in danger and quickly began to swim away as fast as they could. The water around them was turned up, making it difficult to see where the shark was, but they knew they had to get as far away as possible. As they swam, the teenagers could hear the shark's powerful thrashing in the water behind them, which only spurred them to swim faster. They knew they couldn't outrun the shark, but they hoped to create enough distance between themselves and the shark to give them a chance to reach the shore. Despite the terror and panic they felt, the teenagers remained focused on swimming and tried not to let their fear get the best of them. They swam in a zigzag pattern, hoping to make it harder for the shark to follow them. Eventually, after what felt like an eternity, the group reached the shore. They staggered out of the water, panning and trembling with fear, but relieved to have escaped with their lives. They looked out at the water, watching as the shark continued to thrash around, its massive body visible in the churning waves. The attack of the great white shark sent shock waves through the beach, and people quickly realized that they were in danger. As the other teenagers in the water tried to swim away, people on the shore began to scream and shout, urging them to come back to the beach. The beach quickly became a scene of chaos as people scrambled to get out of the water and call for help. As news of the attack spread, more and more people on the beach began to panic. Parents gathered their children and ran for safety, while others called for help and tried to get as far away from the water as possible. Emergency services arrived on the scene quickly, including ambulances, police, and rescue teams. They quickly assessed the situation and began to take action to control the situation and help the victims. Lifeguards were the first to respond, jumping into the water to try to reach Alex and the other teenagers who had been swimming with him. They could see the water turning red with blood, and they knew they were dealing with a serious situation. Paramedics and ambulance crews arrived next, and they immediately began to tend to Alex. Despite their best efforts, however, they could not save him, as he had been bitten in half by the shark. The police arrived on the scene soon after, and they began to cordon off the area, 
preventing people from getting too close to the water. They also searched the surrounding area for any signs of the great white shark, hoping to capture or kill it before it could attack anyone else. Meanwhile, rescue helicopters circled overhead, searching the water for any signs of the shark. They used thermal imaging cameras to try to detect the shark's body heat, but they were unable to locate it. As news of the attack spread, more and more emergency services arrived on the scene, including marine patrol units and Coast Guard vessels. They scoured the water for any signs of the shark. The beach became crowded with onlookers, and many people were outraged that such a dangerous predator could be lurking so close to shore and called for increased measures to control shark populations. For the family and friends of Alex, there was no comfort to be found in the aftermath of the attack. They were left to grieve the loss of a young life cut tragically short and to wonder how something so horrific could happen to someone so innocent. The memory of that day would haunt them forever, a reminder of the brutal and unpredictable nature of the world we live in. Although the great white shark is often considered the most dangerous species of shark in the world, this is a misconception. While they are the most powerful species of shark, bull sharks are actually more dangerous as they are far more aggressive and more likely to attack humans when interacting with them. They have the tendency to stick to shallow coastal waters and can sometimes migrate up rivers when looking for new places to feed in. Bull sharks can be found all around the world, but the case that we're bringing to you today was noted in Sierra Leone, where Michelle Jones, a tourist, would learn the full potency of nature. Michelle was from North Carolina and had a job as a teacher. She lived in the same town all of her life and always wanted to travel the world. But the tight budget of a school teacher in the United States prevented that. Her husband, Roger, was a blue collar worker and rarely had enough time for leisure. The pair lived their lives for many years before Michelle's husband announced that they were taking a trip. She was surprised, and Roger explained that he had won a bonus at his job, and they could use some of their savings to essentially go wherever they wanted to. Michelle was overjoyed by the news, and it took them a few days to agree on where they wanted to go. After some back and forth, they compromised on Sierra Leone, as they had heard amazing things about it. Sierra Leone had fantastic sights, and its beaches were ideal for tourists to lounge and relax from the stress of life. Their trip was booked in no time, and they had two weeks of relaxation ahead of them. They arrived in Sierra Leone on July 17, 1998, after a long flight with a few layovers. So they were quite exhausted and decided just to head to their accommodation and call it a day. The next few days were spent seeing the sights of the city, visiting museums, having drinks, and just enjoying everything the city had to offer. Near the end of the first week, the pair decided they would enjoy some time at the beach. After a day spent lounging around, they went back to their hotel and spotted a sign advertising a cruise from Freetown to Tenafor, which would last for the entire day. Since they were the type to jump at the chance for new experiences, they decided to go on the cruise. Two days later, the cruise was set to start at 9 a.m., so Michelle and Roger got there 30 minutes early. There were 10 more people aside from them, and the tour guide was in high spirits and quite friendly, so the mood was good. They had never been on a cruise before, so they were excited for the day to come. The cruise took two hours to reach its initial destination, after which they would have some time to enjoy the sights and whatever they wanted to do. Then they had the trip back. The trip to Tenafor was relaxing and enjoyable as the weather was on their side and the guide's stories about Sierra Leone was quite enjoyable. Michelle and Roger spent their free time in Tenafor very similarly to their first few days in Freetown, so it was quite enjoyable. The trip back to Freetown was much the same but something that made the boat slow down was a small shiver of sharks accumulating around a single point in the water, something you wouldn't see too often. The guide asked the pilot of the boat to slow down so everyone could get a better look. Upon closer inspection, they saw that there were three sharks feeding on something in the water, and they couldn't identify it on account of all the blood in the water. 
the tourists gathered on the boat's railing to see the shark, as the guide described it as a must-see event. They pressed on the railing, struggling to see over each other to take in as much of the scene as possible. Michelle and Roger were side by side and talking about how interesting the scene was. The sharks were ravenous and zipping through the water, absolutely tearing at whatever was in the water. At the peak of the feeding frenzy, the guide said that the boat would start up at that point to stay on schedule. The boat was turned on and started slowly moving forward, and the guide continued to explain what they would do upon returning to Freetown. However, the guide's words were drowned out of Michelle's ears as she hyper-focused on the squeaky railing getting progressively louder. It gave way. Within a moment, Michelle found herself splashing in the water in the middle of the shiver of sharks. The rest of the people on the boat barely managed to hold on to each other to not follow Michelle. Roger screamed after his wife and made an attempt to jump in after her, but the guide prevented him from doing that that the shark would attack him as well, and they would have to save both of them. The moment she fell into the water, Michelle immediately felt the harsh, coarse skin of one of the sharks shred the skin on her back, making her yelp in pain. She flailed her arms in panic as she tried to get to the surface more securely. Normally, Michelle might have had a chance to swim to safety if it was a different shark species in the water with her. But these were bull sharks and they were hungry. Just as Michelle made eye contact with Roger, she felt a searing pain in her lower thigh, which made her shriek and fall below the surface again. The shark took the move to take the first bite and was quickly out of the way to make way for the next mouth. The guide and the boat's pilot were trying to get the boat closer to Michelle, but it had already moved at least a dozen yards away. Roger was screaming at them to get the boat closer so he could pull his wife to safety, but it wasn't working out at all. Michelle felt another set of teeth clamp down on her ankle, pulling her under the water as a strong force knocked into her ribs, disorienting her. All at once, she felt a tremendous amount of pain as the third shark took hold of her right arm, tearing into it and releasing a red mist in the water around her. The pain was more than too much, so after expressing one final scream with the last of her breath, her consciousness started to fade. The last thing she remembered before waking up in the hospital was her husband's hands clutching her arms and pulling her up from the aquatic hell. According to Roger, Michelle was losing a large amount of blood, so the boat was rushing across the water as fast as it could, while the rest of the people on the boat helped tend to Michelle. The only reason Michelle is alive today is that among the group of tourists, there was a single nurse and the boat had a first aid kit and its essential equipment. Her wounds were bound and tourniquets were applied, but it wasn't much in the way of helping her survive for sure. Emergency services were called to the port where the boat was supposed to dock and two paramedics were ready by the time they got there. She was quickly taken to an ambulance followed by her husband. After she was admitted to the emergency room, the doctors informed Roger that Michelle had lost nearly 35% of her blood, which was near the lethal point, but she would survive. It took a few days for her to stabilize before she could be seen, so Roger was more than relieved when he saw his wife was okay. Her injuries were debilitating as there were some nerve damage and loss of function so she needed a good deal of physical therapy to be able to walk and use her arm properly. That took months, but she did pull through and was back to teaching after a few months of recovery. She said that what happened in Sierra Leone was tragic, but it was the way nature worked. She fell into the shark's plate and they responded instinctively. She mentioned multiple times how much she appreciated her husband and the effort he put in to help her that day. John woke up in the early hours of the morning. He lived in a small town in Florida, right on the coast, and his job as a fisherman required him to wake up early in order to get a head start on the day. He got out of bed, stretched his arms and legs, and then put on his fishing clothes. Juan had been a fisherman for most of his life. He had learned the trade from his father, who had been a fisherman before him. 
Juan loved being out on the water, feeling the salt air on his face and the wind in his hair. He loved the challenge of trying to catch fish, and he loved the freedom that came with being his own boss. Juan walked out of his small house and walked down to the dock where he kept his boat. The dock was busy with other fishermen who were also getting ready for their day on the water. Juan greeted his fellow fishermen with a smile and a wave and then began to prep his boat. He checked the fuel, the water, and the other important systems on his boat, making sure that everything was in good working order. Then he loaded his gear, including his fishing rods, bait, and tackle, and set off into the open sea. The sky was just starting to turn pink and orange as Juan set out on his boat. He loved the feeling of the sun rising behind him and the way the light made the water sparkle. He headed out to his favorite fishing spot, a few miles from shore, and began to cast his lines. Fishing was not always easy, and it required a lot of patience and skill. Juan had to know where the fish would likely be, and he had to be able to read the currents and the tides in order to catch them. He spent several hours casting his lines, moving the boat around to different spots, and trying different kinds of bait. Finally, he felt a tug on his line, signaling that he had caught something. He began to reel in his line, feeling the weight of the fish pulling against the rod. When he finally saw the fish, he felt a rush of excitement. It was a large grouper, one of the most prized catches in Florida. He carefully brought the fish onto the boat, taking care to remove the hook and to measure it to make sure it was within the legal size limit. He put the fish into a cooler and then set out to catch more. After several minutes, he felt a strong tug on his line. He knew immediately that it was no ordinary fish. He began to reel in his line, feeling the weight of the creature pulling against his rod. As he brought the fish closer to the boat, he realized that he had caught something big. He could see the dorsal fin cutting through the water, and he knew that it was a shark. He could feel the adrenaline pumping through his veins as he battled the fish, trying to bring it in. Juan had mixed emotions about the catch. On the one hand, he felt a rush of excitement at the thought of catching such a powerful creature. On the other hand, he knew that sharks were dangerous animals, and he wasn't sure if he was equipped to handle one. He carefully pulled the shark closer to the boat, trying to keep a safe distance. As he got a closer look, he could see that it was a bull shark, a species known for its aggression and strength. The shark thrashed and fought against the line, trying to break free. Juan struggled to keep his footing as the boat rocked back and forth in the water. He knew he had to be careful, or the shark could easily pull him overboard. After a 20-minute battle, Juan was finally able to bring the shark up to the side of the boat. He could see its razor-sharp teeth and its powerful jaws. He knew that he had to be careful if he was going to release the shark back into the water. He carefully removed the hook from the shark's mouth and took a few quick photos, wanting to remember the experience. Just as he was about to measure the length of the shark, it began jerking around and bit him on his ankle. Luckily, he was able to pry away its jaws instantly and only left him with minor wounds. Because of this, he immediately decided to lure the shark back to the water. For a moment, the shark seemed disoriented and confused. Then it suddenly surged forward, disappearing into the depths of the ocean. Juan breathed a sigh of relief, feeling grateful for the experience, but also glad that it was over. Juan sat back in the boat and began treating his wounds, watching the waves ripple from where the shark had disappeared. He sailed back to the dock where he sought medical attention. He was sent home immediately after being treated for his minor wounds. Back at home, he told the unbelievable story to his family, and they knew he had just had one of the most thrilling experiences of his life. It was a moment he would never forget, and a reminder of the power and majesty of the sea.